moment. Is this on? Yeah, I think it's on. I think because we are uh, running a little bit late, uh, we might as well start immediately with this next uh, spotlight session, which is on uh, rule of law and anti-corruption reforms. Um, for those of you who've I, who I haven't met yet in the past day and a half, my name is Wouter Zweers. I'm a research fellow at the Klingendaal Institute in the Netherlands, where I focus on, well, mostly on EU enlargement and on the Euro Europe's eastern neighborhood. Um, and I'm extremely pleased to moderate this well, short spotlight session, uh, as I said, on rule of law, anti-corruption reforms. Um, my task is very difficult today because, oh, well, not only because we have uh, only 45 minutes, but also because we have two surgeons in the panel, which <laughs> complicates <laughs> things. Um, Nevertheless, uh, let me start by sh quickly introducing our speakers and then we can take it from there. I'd like to start with His Excellency Mr. Kreshnik Ahmeti, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Diaspora of the Republic of Kosovo. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Um, our second speaker in the panel, Ms. Viola von Kramon Taubadel, she's a member of the European Parliament uh, for the Greens, where uh, she's rapporteur for the accession uh, process of. Kosovo, uh, part of the Foreign Affairs Committee, amongst, amongst many other uh, functions and positions. A warm welcome to you as well. Um, then we arrive at the, at the surgeons. The problem. Uh, <laughs> first, uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Surgeon, uh, Surgeon Blagovcanin, uh, Chairman of the Board of Directors of Transparency International Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, glad to have you here. And last but not least, Mr. Serjan Majstorovic, Chairman of the Governing Board of the European Policy Center uh, in Belgrade. So welcome to you as well. Thank you. Um, in this spotlight session, I'd like to focus on, well, three broad topics. I think uh, we would first uh, do well to try and look at the current state of anti-corruption and rule of law reforms in the Western Balkans. Of course, we've seen the reports from the European Commission being published uh, a, a few weeks ago. Um, secondly, I think we cannot talk about these issues without taking into account the uh, geopol geopolitical volatility uh, that we've seen in our continent this year following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and third, um, as we are here at the Civil Society Forum of the Berlin Process, it would be good to uh, also have a look at the recommendations from last year and see uh, what the role is of civil society in, uh, well, motivating governments to, to do the necessary uh, reforms. Um, now we will first start with the opening uh, statements of our panelists. Uh, I will use my position as a moderator to, to pose some follow-up questions thereafter. And then uh, at the end, we hopefully have some time for uh, Q&A as well. So please do already think about questions you would like to ask our speakers. Um, and um, I'm going to be strict with the time. Uh, I would like to ask our panelists to uh, take five minutes maximum for the opening statements. And, uh, I will uh, intervene after that time. Um, I'd like to start with you, Mr. Ahmeti. Um, Kosovo report of the enlargement, pack uh, enlargement package noted uh, some progress in your country's fight against corruption, as well as in devol developing a well-functioning judicial system. But also the commission on its website noted that your country needs to intensify its efforts to strengthen democracy, public administration, rule of law, and fight corruption. Um, so I would like to ask you, were you uh, uh, surprised about the report? Were you happy with the report of the European Commission? And do you feel that it adequately uh, captured the reform dynamics in your country? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And first of all, thank you for having, um, uh, putting us together here and having me here and discuss uh, this important issue. Of course, as with uh, every report, uh, the subject that is being reported on has some um, topics that might want to correct, but that is true the same way that every country still needs reforms and progress. You know, progress is perpetual in a sense that you never reach a final uh, destination. But we were glad that this year's country report noted the progress made uh, last year by the government. 
And it is the first time in the case of Kosovo that no areas were identified as backsliding uh, or no progress, which I believe shows that Kosovo uh, is entering a new phase in its democratic, institutional and economic uh, matters and, and progress. It is clear that more work uh, needs to be done, uh, but from my point of view, it's important that the trends are positive. Uh, as a government, we won the elections in an unprecedented majority uh, with two uh, main commitments, two J's we called them, jobs and justice, and these two J's became the two pillars of our governmental program. So uh, as today we uh, are focusing mostly on the rule of law and uh, fighting corruption, I'll focus on the second J, the, the justice of our uh, program. Uh, we are undergoing major reforms and restructuring in the judicial system in, in Kosovo. Uh, last year, we um, voted, uh, we approved in the government the rule of law strategy for five years, which is a kind of an umbrella for uh, reforming and um, reforming our judicial uh, system in, in general. So I'll go uh, briefly to mention the laws on which we've worked on. Uh, we uh, approved the vetting process in accordance with the recommendations of the Venice Commission, which I believe is really important because we also have to deal with the wrongdoings of the past. And also we have voted a number of, uh, of uh, laws uh, that restructure the judicial system, which means that for the future <coughs> we are creating the mechanisms uh, for a fair treatment of of our citizens and, and businesses. Uh, for example, we also established for the first time the uh, court, uh, commercial court, which has started to, to work now since September, and this helps uh, the economy a lot. Uh, I, I won't go through every one of them since uh, I do not want to pass the time, but uh, besides dealing with the past and making the mechanism for the future, we are also dealing with the present in the sense of fighting corruption and organized crime. And here the figures, I believe, are uh, impressive. Uh, there are 797 uh, police operations which dealt for a year and a half with organized crime and fight against corruption. Over 2,000 people have been indicted and arrested in charges of organized crime and um, corruption, and 265 of them were public officials. Uh, and 69 criminal groups have been destroyed for a year and a half since the government is in place. Uh, so this fight against corruption and organized crimes and these reforms have been uh, acknowledged also by uh, independent in international institutions. Uh, for example, Kosovo has been ranked the first in Western Balkans by the World Justice Report on Rule of Law. Uh, in the Transparency International Index, it improved its position by 17 places. Uh, also, Kosovo jumped by 17 places on the Press Freedom Index of the Reporters Without Borders. And more recently, Kosovo was ranked first in Europe and second globally for the biggest improvement in rule of law in 2021 uh, from World Justice uh, Project. Thank you very much. Just as a maybe, and thank you for outlining some of these results that, that your government has achieved over the past uh, time. Um, Maybe as a short follow-up question, where do you see a uh, need or the room uh, for, for or the space for intensifying efforts? Is, are there specific fields where you say in the coming months, this is where we really want to achieve uh, the next step? The next step would be the reforms in judicial system uh, because uh, you can work, uh, you can fight corruption, organized crime in the field, so to say, on the ground. But uh, if it gets, uh, the, the bottleneck currently is at the judicial system and you cannot finalize uh, fighting corruption and organized crime that way. So I believe with, with the vetting process and uh, having more credibility and more capacity in our judicial system, this would be our main, uh, this will be our main focus in the coming months and years because it's a relatively long process and a complex one. Thank you. Um, moving to Ms. von Kramon, um, and zooming out maybe from Kosovo to the region at large, um, how do you see the current state and the progress of the rule of law, anti-corruption reforms in the countries of the region? Um, and well, the, how do you see the, the commission reports that were published in that regard? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thanks, uh, Walter, for um, 
giving me the opportunity to at least um, give some remarks on, on the situation, how it is being seen from, uh, from Brussels, from the EU institutions, so to say, and also especially from the Parliament side, why, uh, of course, it's important to recall that rule of law is the uh, pillar uh, for all uh, the things we do uh, on behalf of any accession process, and sometimes it is a little bit overseen when we speak about alignment with uh, common uh, foreign policy and security policy or other issues, uh, but uh, on, on a, on a nutshell, in a nutshell, we really should focus much more on what's happening on rule of law and how much this would also influence the development, the domestic uh, development um, in all of the countries. And the example of Kosovo shows how much a country can change when the political will is there and how much it makes a difference if you have a country who puts this as, as one of the top priorities. We can go into more details on what is maybe missing, but in general, I mean, you see a significant shift uh, from not just the uh, index, but also in, in terms of uh, content on the ground. So I think it is important to say that um, rule of law is the main precondition for all kinds of EU accession uh, processes, and this is laid down in the Copenhagen criteria. Um, uh, and of course, uh, that goes hand in hand with the fight against uh, corruption. And there, I would say we have a very, um, let's say, different pictures in, in some of the countries. Uh, I think the EU has been much to lose and has been not strict enough when it comes to the merit-based uh, uh, process. Uh, I think there was a huge backsliding and rather fake implementation of reforms, which sometimes you can find on paper, but really not um, uh, in, a, in a practical term. And um, of course, if uh, things have no consequence, it is extremely hard uh, for the political actors uh, to say, well, if we go away with it, why should we change uh, the course? Yeah. So um, on one hand, I think it is important uh, that we focus much more on uh, um, supporting civil society, such as transparency, but also many others who monitor the process in the particular countries. But on the other hand, if we have uh, the progress report, which clearly states that there's, there's no progress in many of the countries, then it has to have uh, severe consequences, especially in financial terms, because, I mean, being honest, I'm the biggest promoter of EU enlargement, and I just come from a conference where I expressed my frustration that there is no progress. But on the other hand, we also need to uh, remind our friends in the region that uh, it is very closely interlinked with when my taxpayers uh, ask me, what do you think, is the money properly invested? And you think, yes, in general, yes, but. Yeah. So of course I know that in the state capture uh, countries such as Serbia, it is extremely difficult to make sure that without independent media, without independent judiciary, uh, there is a fair and free, uh, let's say, um, pre procurement process and so on and so forth, while um, everything is in the hand of one party, is in the hand of one person who actually rules the country, and there is no competition whatsoever, and there's no independent judiciary, there's no prosecution. And that needs to be, I think, communicated in a different way and has to have uh, proper uh, uh, proper sanction. So uh, the, the example of Montenegro, I think we have partially seen that there were some attempts to go um, after grant and pity uh, corruption, but of course it's extremely difficult where we see that there is a political crisis uh, to finally things which are obviously right, but you do not have mm -hmm. a political majority for, 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 for those reforms. Uh, and uh, then uh, in the end, the picture is still rather gray than, than white, uh, which we at least see it's not really fair because there, is, there are some uh, people in Montenegro who have no interest whatsoever to go for real reforms. And so we can go through um, the individual uh, countries, but I think the European Parliament in general is uh, always on the side of the civil society and of those forces and those 
groups and those institutions in the country who would like to see uh, reforms being implemented and, of course, a more transparent um, uh, and a more integral uh, political framework for uh, the economical environment, but also for the political environment. Well, thank you very much. And coming from the Netherlands, I, I very much agree with your point that the rule of law is maybe the main precondition in the whole EU enlargement uh, framework. Um, Mr. Blagov Chanin, if we zoom in on uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, how, do you how do you see the state of rule of law reforms in that country? Uh, I think we've seen uh, some of us were maybe a little bit surprised that the European Commission made the recommendation to grant Bosnia and Herzegovina candidate status. Uh, do you feel that this is directly related to uh, reform progress in the country or, or may there have been some other uh, um, uh, factors that played a role there, please? Uh, yes, many thanks. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank organizers and the German government for organizing this uh, great uh, event, I believe, that is very important in particular uh, in this uh, moment. And uh, also, I'm very glad that we are discussing the uh, state of uh, rule of law and the uh, fight against corruption in the Balkans. And not only because I'm coming from Transparency International, but uh, I believe that we would all agree um, that uh, establishing or strengthening the rule of law and the fight against corruption uh, are precondition for uh, the implementation of all uh, recommendations that we put together as part of our joint, joint work. Uh, by the same token, I would also uh, say that I believe that uh, strengthening or establishing a rule of law and meaningful fight against corruption are the most complex tasks for the Western Balkan countries on their uh, reform path towards the EU. The most complex in a way that uh, substantial progress in those areas would require complete overhaul uh, and transformations transformation of our societies and our political systems in the way how they operate in terms of separation of the power, which is still problematic, I would say, across the region, in terms of limitation of power, in terms of uh, check and balances, protecting human rights, etc. Unfortunately, and let's be honest, we haven't seen much progress all across the region. We do have uh, laws adopted, we do have institutions formed, but when it comes uh, to results to the, uh, in practice, I would say that we haven't seen uh, uh, much progress. Back to your question to zoom in on the situation in Bosnia, sorry for a long uh, uh, intro. Uh, yes, good news is that the uh, European Commission uh, recommended granting uh, candidacy status to Bosnia and Herzegovina last month. Uh, on the occasion of uh, 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 publishing an uh, enlargement package. But in the same time, European Commission concluded <laughs> in the report for Bosnia and Herzegovina that there has been no progress whatsoever. On the contrary, deterioration of the situation. So you shouldn't be an expert on Bosnia or EU enlargement to conclude that, is not, that the recommendation was not based on, on uh, merit criteria. Uh, a little bit retrospective. In 2019, European Commission uh, issued the opinion on uh, candidacy application of Bosnia and Herzegovina with 14 priorities that should be implemented by Bosnia and Herzegovina in order for Bosnia to get uh, candidacy status. After three years, only two priorities have been implemented partially. Now they are awarded. So it's, it's obvious that situation since 2019 in Bosnia and Herzegovina deteriorated dramatically. Due to the political and institutional crisis, countries sliding towards uh, uh, ungovernability. Basic functions are in question in a, in, in, a, in a country. So in that regard, Bosnia and Herzegovina is very good example what happened when we neglect rule of law and anti-corruption. And just a few, few, few uh, 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 facts from uh, TI uh, surveys. Bosnia and Herzegovina is ranked third worst uh, corrupt country in the Europe, and in the same time among the 
countries globally where the situation deteriorates uh, the most. So very uh, <laughs> illustrative, uh, illustrative. And in the same time, Bosnia and Herzegovina has no strategy or any policy uh, uh, against corruption or uh, uh, judicial uh, strat uh, uh, strategy for the judicial reform. So that's obvious uh, that there is no political will in, in that regard. And for illustration, how a dramatic situation is, only this year, uh, three most, uh, 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 the highest ranking judicial uh, office holders uh, have been blacklisted by United States administration on the ground of being involved in political corruption or due to links with organized crime. So basically it's total symbiosis of the state with organized crime, mafia, drug trafficking, and, and it's, it's difficult to, 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 to uh, find the borderline between two of that. So obviously... Please come to a conclusion, thank you. <laughs> just, just to... Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, so obviously, current approach doesn't work. And that leads us to the famous Einstein quote, if you're doing the same thing over and over, and over again and expecting different uh, results, it is not maybe the best or the most clever strategy uh, to do in, 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 in such context. So what I would like, and, and I will conclude with that, what I would like uh, 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 to say that we would need, and I, I believe that we will uh, all agree on the, on the size of the problem and urgency of the problem and the importance of the problem all across the, 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 the region, but what we would need to find different approach uh, towards the strengthening or establishing rule of law uh, depends on the on the country context and fight against corruption and mm -hmm. take it really seriously and as a matter of priority. Well, thank you. And maybe we can try to end this panel with some uh, outlooks yes. for the future and some ideas. Um, thank you for, for painting this picture, a, a bleak picture, uh, I must say. Um, maybe moving on to Mr. Mastorovic, um, uh, it seemed that there are was some good news last week when Commission President von der Leyen mm -hmm. tweeted that Serbia is advanced on its EU integration path. So, um, looking at rule of law, democratization efforts, and the European Commission report, uh, would you agree with their statement? And how do you see Serbia's current efforts in, in combating corruption and promoting rule of law? Thank you. Thank you very much, Voter. It's a pleasure to be here in Berlin. Uh, let me start by... by um, saying that um, when Sergeant speaks, when I speak, we really do not want to send a message of doom and gloom. And this is what we are facing in events like this, being labeled as some sort of a, you know, uh, very dark people who are <laughs> criticizing their country. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is reality in which we are living in. And this is the fact. This is not promotion of the doom and gloom. No. So please be aware of this, uh, this labeling before we start. On the, on the uh, uh, statement, or rather tweet, of uh, Ms. von der Leyen, it was disappointing. I mean, I, I, maybe you saw my, my uh, message on, on Twitter. Um, it was disappointing because um, uh, the, the, the institution that she's heading came up with a report just two weeks ago which said that Serbia is only moderating, uh, moderately prepared to assume the obligations from the membership. And this this ranking of Serbia has not changed since 2016. And this is a problem, a problem that Sergeon was, was mentioning, uh, that the process, it's not working, it's not delivering. But what we witness with this um, public display of enthusiasm is disappointing because um, with that she's uh, undermining the role of the civil society, of the critical voices in our countries. It's very difficult after that statement to go out to TV and to say that things are not going well in Serbia. When the president of the European Commission herself said that Serbia is well advanced and that Serbia is going the right way, and we all know that Serbia has a problem. And this is the second point of your question. Um, Serbian leadership is not doing, not even close enough to, to prove its serious uh, uh, intention to fulfill the EU accession requirements. I'm publicly trying to explain to citizens of Serbia that the situ situation in Serbia today is much worse than 10 years ago when we applied for the accession to the uh, EU membership. At that time, European Commission 
made an assessment, said that Serbia is sufficiently prepared in the sense of respect of democracy, rule of law, democratic principles. Uh, but this today is not the fact. And this is, this is an alarming situation. The, the, the division of power, the lines of division of powers have been blurred. We don't know where the political influence on judiciary starts and where, where does it stop. Uh, the, the, the parliament is behaving like a part of the executive. Uh, this is not natural status of the political system that uh, is supposed to be a healthy one. So the political system is being corrupted. It is being corrupted with the fact that we have a, a irregular election, electoral rounds of elections uh, that nobody knows when they will happen. In the past, uh, Rasha Nedelkov here is from CERTA, and they are a very prominent organization that follows the electoral processes in Serbia. In the last six years, we had four rounds of uh, elections. It's not the natural environment for democracy, for democratic institutions, to deliver what, what is required. Uh, and to, to come to a conclusion, not to be over, over extensive, um, either we will uh, move forward and try to regain the trust in the transformative and transactional power of the EU integration process, or we will come into a situation where our citizens will keep joining the EU by foot, mm -hmm. And our governments will remain uh, stuck back in the Balkans um, and discussing the uh, same old stories uh, uh, and the same crisis that they helped to develop and now pretending to be uh, resolving. So I'll stop here for the introductory part. Thank you very much. Um, let's move to, to the sort of the second topic, because of, uh, second topic, because of course, rule of law reforms are not taking place in a vacuum we've seen this year. Uh, as I said at the beginning, the geopolitical volatility in, uh, on the co European continent, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Ahmedi, I'd like to ask you, how does the war in Ukraine, uh, well, do you see maybe uh, an impact of those geopolitical tensions and this, this invasion of Ukraine on, uh, on rule of law reforms, on democratization efforts? Is there, is there a link between the, the two? Uh, <clears throat> you might find some impact, of course. Uh, it depends on how the situation was even prior to the aggression. Uh, Kosovo is a democratic country. For example, I mentioned the um, presidential support that we got in the recent general elections, but immediately after that, in the local elections, the opposition parties won the majority of the municipalities, which shows that there is rotation uh, of power, which is really important. Uh, what uh, we were had to deal with mostly from the impact of the Russian aggression, besides the economic uh, impact that we're all dealing with, is uh, the, um, at the rule of law, but the security sector. Immediately, I think it was one or two months after the Russian aggression started, we had five attacks um, uh, near the border with Serbia on our police officers, two of them with uh, firearms, one of these two coming from the Serbia territory. Uh, and also, we, as, as we all know, we had uh, instances of uh, during summer when roads were blocked and those weren't blocked. And now this is a really important thing that weren't blocked by the, our Serb citizens. Those were some kind of criminal professional groups with masks and black uniforms because uh, fortunately now Serb citizens of Kosovo are, are fed up with such uh, being tools in a way for, for such uh, actions and, and they do not uh, react anymore. But uh, as a last resort now, it seems that Belgrade is using more professional uh, units to, to deal with these um, issues. Uh, so mostly it's in the security uh, sector. Mm -hmm. uh, as we know now, even recently with the license uh, plates issue, uh, yesterday, uh, Serbia has put its army on high alert and uh, started spreading fake news that Kosovo is having drones around the border, so they flew two fighter jets. Uh, we have to know that Serbia has 48 forward operational bases of its army in the line border with Kosovo, so they are not defensive, they are forward operational bases. So uh, this was the tension that uh, we were dealt with. And of course, uh, every country has limited capacity. So this meant that uh, we had to focus on these issues uh, yeah. and not uh, deal with others. Thank you. Mr. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Mr. Blagov, 
Janine, um, what effects do you see of these geopolitical tensions? Do you feel that rule of law reforms are maybe fading a bit? To, I mean, the picture you painted was already a bit bleak, but do you feel that rule of law reforms, that there's even less sort of attention to them in light of these geopolitical tensions that we now see? I'm speaking uh, for Bosnian context, I mean, it's obvious that the crisis in Bosnia is lasting uh, institutional and political uh, for many years. And also there is uh, another layer of uh, complexity with regard uh, to Bosnia, a specific role of uh, international community embodied uh, in the institution of uh, high representative, okay. which recently <laughs> triggered a lot of dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction among the Bosnian and Herzegovina citizens. Uh, just, just a few sentences uh, on, on what happened for the people who are not uh, following. Uh, uh, on the very day when Bosnia Herzegovina uh, had elections uh, just a month ago, a high representative basically uh, imposed uh, amendments on the constitution of the of the uh, Bosnia and the Herze Federation of the Bosnia and Herzegovina, which triggered, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, dissatisfaction dissatisfaction of the of the uh, Bosnian and Herzegovina citizens because they they recognize that as as, as not uh, 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 compatible with democratic standards. So why is that important? Uh, in the Peace Implementation Council, which is governing the work of High Representative, uh, there are. Uh, several countries which uh, um, interests are not uh, necessarily the same as the uh, interest uh, of the Bosnia and Herzegovina in terms of joining the, the, the EU and situation is uh, still basically frozen since the end of conflict. So Bosnia and Herzegovina, what I would like to say that Bosnia and Herzegovina is probably uh, even more vulnerable uh, to geopolitical uh, turmoils uh, uh, after the Russian aggression on the, on the Ukraine. And in particular, uh, having in mind that one part of the country in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Republic of Srpska, is openly basically uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, the, 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 what's, uh, the, the Russian uh, aggression. So that's uh, basically uh, another, another layer of the problems when it comes mm -hmm. to the, the, the political situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, of course, in, the, in, in, in such context that democratization and rule of law are um, not priorities. Mm -hmm. Well, Ms. Kralman, if the countries in the region are so vulnerable, right, to these geopolitical uh, developments, wouldn't, should the EU then maybe set the democratization rule of law demands aside for a little bit and maybe focus on security fully, or, or how do you see that? I think <coughs> this is not an either-or question. I mean, we would not do a favor to the citizens, as Sajan has rightly said. We owe it to the citizens that the transformative power goes hand in hand with the security. I think we have to take care of the stability and peace and reconciliation and, and dialogue and everything. But uh, there will be no, let's say, credit uh, on, on domestic reforms because this would not make sense. Uh, if we go along in this Berlin process and if we hopefully tomorrow or this, the head of state manage to sign these agreements, this is a huge step forward. We have to communicate on that. We have to say why it is important. But on the other hand, in all the stabilization association agreements, in all SAA, we have uh, clearly said, and uh, head of states and all the governments have signed what they are up to. So I think there should be no discount on anything, because what a surgeon has said, otherwise the people would leave, would go, to places where they find rule of law, where they find a proper uh, political and uh, economical environment, where they have independence, judiciary, and so on and so forth. So it is up to us to create these standards, which people would like to see in the European Union, but also back at home. And it is up to us um, to implement that and to sanction if things are not, um, if, uh, things are not working. What, um, I would maybe differentiate a little bit from, I do not see a direct parallel from the Ukraine war in the region. I see that some of the, let's say, actors, political actors, try to get uh, to benefit from that. I think that's not okay. -ish. I think we should really watch the situation uh, and witness or observe the situation very carefully, but we should not overdo this and uh, compare things which are not too much related to each other. 
I'm not saying that it is calm and smooth and uh, absolutely, uh, how to say, um, irrelevant, but sometimes you see also makeup stories uh, and this can also endanger than um, spontaneous uh, reactions which are not intended or wanted. So I call on each and every one, not on one side, uh, to really make sure that everything which is in their responsibility is really being done and not to provoke the other side. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mastorovic, do you also feel that we should detach these issues a little bit and maybe from each other and maybe... Uh, do you feel that uh, a merit-based accession process is still possible in these in these times this year? I am risking to be a, a very boring interlocutor, just to agree with uh, with uh, Viola what she said, uh, and I honestly believe that we we need to be very cautious uh, making a, a equation sign between what's going on in Ukraine and what's going on in the region. These are, I would say, a very very separate separate things. Listen, the geopolitical importance of the Western Balkans existed even before the, the start of the war. The war in Ukraine just amplified it, and that's the fact. We had uh, um, uh, strategic infrastructure investments coming from the third parties in the region. We had energy sector investments, media presence of, uh, of different media outlets, uh, cyber activities, malign political influence uh, on bilateral relations in the region, on structural issues of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it was there. The Ukrainian war just amplified it and obviously created a, a very nice niche for those who are saying, oh, now we need to focus on the geopolitical challenges. As Viola said, it's uh, not this or that. It's everything. And let me remind us all here, issues like rule of law, uh, reform of judiciary, fight against corruption, organized crime, media freedoms, um, resolution of Kosovo-Serbia uh, normalization process. Um, these are all elements which were well, very well known 10 years ago and which were put in the negotiating framework of Serbia's EU accession process. And this is why it is very, very frustrating when uh, foreign dignitaries are pick and choose different aspects of this agenda and making it priority in relationship with, uh, with the, my case, with my country, with Serbia. There is no this or that. It's everybody on the, on the table, and all these things need to be fulfilled. Should we really be honest to ourselves and say, okay, we understand what, what, what is the requirements, what are the requirements, and we are ready uh, to, uh, to deliver on it. But for that, we need to have a credible EU accession process. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, that's, uh, that's something that, uh, unfortunately, in this given geopolitical context, I'm, I'm you know, still puzzled how we are not moving fast enough. Yep. There are some positive moves, avoiding the candidacy status to Eastern European countries, uh, recommendation on Bosnia and Herzegovina, recommendation repeated, unfortunately, for how, who knows how many times on visa liberalization for Kosovo, which are not being followed through. And this all jeopardizes the, 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 the framework within which we need to resolve these issues that we are mentioning. Thank you. I think uh, we have about five minutes left, so I would like to move to the concluding statements from our speakers. And uh, maybe a final topic to discuss is also specifically the role of civil society organizations and think tanks in the region. So maybe as a general question for, for all of our panelists, uh, First, um, well, do you see uh, room still to move forward uh, when it comes to rule of law reforms, when it comes to anti-corruption efforts, um, given the, well, uh, not very uh, optimistic picture that we've <laughs> discussed in this panel? Um, and, and second, what role do you see specifically for the civil society organizations and the think tanks in the region and, and, and where can they maybe step up their efforts on, on these topics? Uh, Mr. Ahmed, I'd like to start with you, and please, uh, only one minute, because uh, yeah, otherwise I'll, we're running out. I'll try to be brief. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, well, um, we try to do our best as a government, of course, to have uh, full inclusion uh, within these processes. We have uh, already set up mechanisms, which were previously by other governments set up, uh, of uh, public consultations, be that on concepts, strategies, or laws. 
but not only in this formal sense, uh, in most of the processes in um, our endeavor for visa free regime or the uh, coming application for EU membership or Council of Europe application, uh, civil society members, uh, be them from think tanks or, or academia, are already involved in those processes. So uh, it is our responsibility to lead these processes, but also to be inclusive. And uh, hopefully we're doing a good job. We'll do uh, a better job on whatever we are lacking currently. Thank you. Uh, Ms. von Kramon, please. Well, I mean, I can agree also with that. I would say that uh, in a formal process, we see a lot of box ticking exercises that inclusion, maybe not referring to Kosovo, but in some of the other countries, inclusion is taking place in terms of uh, NGOs, academia and so on. But when I see then that there's a lot of pressure on independent media and on, 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 on some of the human rights defenders, on uh, independent activists and so on. So the reality is that definitely <laughs> not as it is said in, 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 in some of these um, EU uh, reports. And that's why it is important, I would say, for people like uh, our president of the EU Commission, not just to visit the um, head of state and the government, but also maybe Silta and others where you see the full picture of what's happening in these countries. And you could also name in each and every country that you have a really strong civil society, academia, independent press, investigative uh, journalist, and so on. And I think this needs to be included in uh, delegations of head of states, but also of other members from the EU who are visiting the, the, the region. Thank you. Mr. Blagovtin. Uh, very briefly, uh, rule of law and uh, anti-corruption reforms are not technical processes only, but political processes as well. So in that regard, it's about uh, articulation of political will for those processes. So I believe that in that regard, that's the role of, of, of think tanks and civil society, articulation of demand for reforms and for change. And the uh, uh, second thing is that, as I said in, in, in my opening statement, obviously, uh, current approach doesn't work, doesn't deliver. So, and, and, and I quoted Einstein in that regard. So what we need here, we would need based on lesson learned, second generation of how we call it in, in, in TI, second generation of rule of law reforms. Thank you. Mr. Masorovic. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we have no alternatives but to be very persistent and, and to be boring advocating for, for, for the real, you know, real changes, offering uh, ideas, requesting um, our presence to be included, to be involved, to monitor and communicate in an objective way uh, um, to the public factual state of the affairs uh, uh, of the situation in our, our countries. And this is why in this document that you can uh, all find in the desk in front, we ask uh, EU, its uh, member states, uh, to focus on fundamentals. Eventually, it is investment in security. You cannot have a secure Europe without democratic apparatus working properly in our region without institutions who have a clearly div div division of power, of competences, who are doing their job with the profes professional administration. We are also asking our governments to show unity in time of crisis uh, and different attempts to undermine Europe, Europe's cohesion. Um, and that implies to, to resolve basically the pending issues which are uh, often abused in the region, as I earlier said, as a smokescreen, while democracy and rule of law are being uh, under threat. Um, we have no luxury to be complacent because um, if we lose, the EU lose. That's one of the conclusions. And to quote um, the, the President of the European Commission, her speech uh, in the European Parliament when, when she uh, presented the State of the Union address, when, he, when she rightfully uh, uh, said that uh, the path towards stronger uh, democracies and the path towards the Union are one and the same. We are just asking to make this very clear when meeting our representatives and stick to that rule throughout the EU integration process. Well, thank you very much. Um, this was, of course, uh, only a spotlight session, meaning I think we own, yeah, we, we scratched the surface of all the topics that we could talk about for, for way longer. Um, 
uh, nevertheless, I, I take away from this, this discussion that I think uh, there's a need for civil society organizations, for think tanks, both in the region and in the EU, to, to remain persistent, as you said, to um, report openly about, about factual developments uh, on the ground. And um, that's, uh, that, may be, uh, that should be our hope, I think, for, for, for the future years. Um, so I'm for the rest, I'm not going to try to, to uh, make some conclusions myself. So just like to ask you to join me in thanking our panelists in this session.